Last week, Brighton launched their latest flagship cycling GPS computer, the Rider S500. Pitched at the higher end of the cycling GPS market, they claim it's a premium level product because that's what they printed on the box. Price-wise, it's positioned alongside the Wahoo Element Bolt 2 and the Garmin Edge 530. I'll also include the Hammerhead Karoo 2 there in that pricing list because I'll be doing a few head-to-heads with that unit today with this one. The S500 has already been reviewed quite extensively in the last week with a lot of initial reviews out there covering the on-paper specifications and first-look experiences. In this video today, I'm covering more than just the tech specs of this unit. I go down a few rabbit holes, we find a few roadblocks, I cover the good, the bad, and the extensive list of things that need fixing on the S500. Now firstly, if you're looking for a how-to video on the Brighton units, such as unboxing, setup, configuration of features, jump over to their YouTube channel. They have an extensive list of videos covering everything you can think of, which pretty much puts me out of a job creating content like that on this unit. What that does allow me to do though is create other videos discussing the hands-on user experience and what it's really like to own one of these and have it operating on the front of the bike. Okay, kicking off with the good on the S500. The two things this unit needs to do well, it actually does very well. And that is GPS tracking, that is fantastic. Here it is head to head with the Hammerhead Karoo 2, which on the end of my ride yesterday, it appeared the Hammerhead had dropped off to the pub for a few beers and bumped its way home. Go home Hammerhead, you're drunk. So the S500 does very, very well with GPS tracking. The other feature of the S500, which is very, very welcome, is the battery life. Has it claimed 30 hours? I haven't got 30 hours of riding with this yet, but the battery burn rate wasn't too bad at all compared to what I would call something on the other end of the spectrum, which was the Karoo 2 that I was riding with. The touch screen on the S500, while a little small, is responsive and it works well. A single touch does bring up a status menu, which can be configured, and that can pop up if you don't swipe enough. The Rider S500 does have Varia radar support, so it gets a big tick from me there. It has a USB-C port on the back for fast charging. The live tracking did work, albeit quite basic, only speed, distance, and time, but the website loaded, although it didn't send the notification email. I had to manually send the link for that. SRAM ETAP gear information is recorded within the FitFile, although there is no third-party option to sync directly to the SRAM access web. I had to upload this FitFile manually. And with this, I'll assume it also saves DI2 gearing information too. The S500 also has a version of Climb Pro, which most cycling GPS companies are now following Garmin's lead on and creating their own uh, Climb Pro versions. They call it Climb Challenge on the S500. Smart notifications work well, well enough. That's my front door, not my front do. Page and data field configuration from the Brighton Active app is also good. And there's also the Garmin style press and hold trick, which works for changing fields on your screens on the fly. One of the interesting observations with the S500 feature sets is it doesn't have Wi-Fi. It relies on Bluetooth exclusively for data sync. Now the active app then does all the heavy lifting in the absence of Wi-Fi. It's quite interesting they've gone that route. The older 750 unit does have Wi-Fi. This likely saves on battery, this being 20 hours, the old 750, this going up to 30 hours. So it might be a reason for that there. For sensor support though, we have Bluetooth and AMP plus sensors. Now, relying on the app for all that heavy lifting isn't a bad thing, although the app is a little buggy and a rough around the edges, and that's been the case for many, many years. Okay, now onto my observations and issues. This is quite the shopping list. Take a seat, grab a coffee, let's roll. The S500 screen is lacking in color and contrast. It has an ambient sensor, which is nice, but to put it simply, side to side, up against the Hammerhead Karoo 2, it's just not in the same ballpark. The maps, as you can see, lack cycling specific detail. You can see here, the Hammerhead does a very good job of highlighting the bike path that I'm on because I'm on a bike. The S500, on the other hand, seems to have gotten the car-based maps and just plonked them onto the screen here. The S500 has 16 gig of storage space, which I guess isn't too bad in this day and age. However, 14.2 gig of that is taken up by maps. So speaking of the heavy lifting done by the app to do the data transfer, if you're doing big map updates, that could be quite interesting. Um, I couldn't export the fit file that I was uh, recording from either the Brighton Active Web or the mobile app. I needed to pull out a USB cable to access the fit file on this. It was like using a Garmin 10 years ago. Voice navigation is a hero feature of this, but look, to be absolutely honest, I have no interest at all in asking my GPS where to go. Out on the road, it's gonna be windy, it's gonna be noisy. I'm sure if I ask it to go home, it'll probably route me to Rome. I did ask it to route me to McDonald's, which did work, but I've never ever wanted that feature. So voice navigation, it's one of those hero features. 
If you use voice navigation, I think it's a great feature. Uh, let me know in the comments below. I think they could have ignored that and put development elsewhere. Speaking of development elsewhere, sticky watts. Here is a big problem with the S500. And here we go down today's rabbit hole, jumping here to my favorite website on the internet, the DCR Analyzer tool, where we can compare multiple activity files as an overlay and see how things stack up. Now, what I was recording was the Quark Axis with the Karoo 2 and the Asioma Duo with the SPD hack with the Brighton Rider S500. These two power meters agree very, very well when it comes to reporting the power that I'm doing, both indoors and out. I've got hours and hours of data. These two power meters are very, very close together, except when the two head units recording things, record things a little differently. Looking at overall ride averages for power can be misleading depending on the head units used. And this is a prime example of why this can be a problem. So with two power meters that always agree with each other, we have 173 average versus 199 average. That's quite the difference. And here's why. Jumping into a lot of the on off, on off, or start stop riding on the bike path, we have an average of 152 on the quark axis, and we have an average of 190 on the Asioma duos. Remembering these two power meters agree with each other. What the problem here though, is the recording of that data. The S500 has sticky watts, and you can see those in blue, uh, a little bit here at the start, but it squares off here, 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 and the list goes on throughout the entire ride elevating or inflating that average power, giving effectively incorrect power readings. When it sees no power or zero power, it hangs onto the last value a little bit too long. Now, if I jump into a section that the power meters are continually working, except for this middle section through here, 252, 251, without this little jump in the middle there, you can see the two power meters agree. Where things disagree though, is in the recording side of things, and that's due to the S500 hanging on to that power number a little bit too long when it sees no power. Same goes for cadence. Scrolling down to the cadence. Again, it's all about the start stop. The steady state stuff is fine. Indoors will be fine, as long as there's no start and stop. Here's the cadence again. You can see there the blue is hanging on way too much, whereas the Hammerhead Karoo 2 and the Quark is dropping off and dropping down to zero a lot faster when I'm not pedaling. So sticky watts and sticky cadence, what does that mean? Does it really matter? For me, yeah, it does. I'm unable to use the S500 to record a power meter and compare it to others because it's holding onto those power figures and pretty much screwing with the data. It would also mean that if you have a bike with a power meter and change nothing other than just the head unit, let's just say you go from a Garmin or a Wahoo to one of these, and you're looking at your TSS, your average watts, your kilojoules burned, etc., those numbers are going to be a little different simply due to the head unit that you're using. Further on this, and probably even more serious than that, if you're using the Brighton S500 to dual record for, say, eSport racing, where you need to verify both your trainer power and another source of power, those numbers are going to be different, maybe a lot different, resulting in you being disqualified or booted from the competition when your two power meters might work perfectly together in reporting the real power that you're doing. You see where I'm heading with this? That needs to be addressed. That's a big one. Okay, I'll leave that there for now. The S500 does have smart trainer control. Uh, the set point watts worked, so manual erg mode. However, level mode didn't work on the kicker bike. That might need to look into. Further on my list of technical issues with the S500 is that it doesn't record sensor IDs within the fit file. Let's say I had a polar heart rate strap on, I had a stages power meter on, the unit will record that data, but if I was to go back and look at what sensors I had connected, it doesn't tell me makes things a little difficult in the future to go back and review what things I had connected at the time. There's also no amp plus cycling dynamic support. So if you have vectors, rallies, or the axiomas, you can't get those extra metrics. There's also no support for what I would call extended sensors, such as the tire wheeze and the core body temperature sensor. Whilst that's not important for some, it's better to have that support and not use it than have the sensor and not be able to use it. The S500 does have bike profiles on it, but doesn't differentiate between them within the fit file, meaning that your road ride, gravel ride, mountain bike ride, or indoor ride cannot be categorized properly by just looking at the data file. Now, I think this is important. The fit file specification actually has this implemented with the subsport field. Here's how Garmin do it. Here's how Brighton are not doing it. Having that correctly reported allows for better data mining in the future, maybe for gravel or mountain bike route suggestions. If they know which rides have been on gravel, much easier to tell you where to go ride on gravel. Uh, the mount, default mount, which I've taken off the back here, isn't Garmin quarter turn compatible. Now, thankfully, they know most of us have Garmin mounts, so they've included a compatible Garmin mount in the box that we can screw off theirs and put the Garmin one on. 
Thanks for that. And finally, looping back to the no Wi-Fi, that does mean that you do need to have your phone paired and nearby for this to sync any data or any of your rides to. Or you can pull out a USB cable like we did with Garmin units about 10 years ago. Now a few things that I haven't touched on on this video. Firstly, navigation, and by all accounts, it's probably something I wanna steer clear of for now. Uh, I also have no hands-on with the Climb Challenge functionality, Brighton's version of Climb Pro. I love Climb Pro on the Hammerhead. It's not too bad on the Garmin's. How these guys do it looks okay, but I'll need to test it out on rides where I'm not recording two power meters at once due to this thing having sticky watts. Look, so as you can see, as you push past the top layer of features and start digging into the user experience and the technical operation of the S500, it has a few flaws. Back in 2019, I reviewed the Rider 450 unit and provided similar feedback on a number of issues. To their credit, Brighton have addressed a lot of the issues raised with that unit and implemented them in the 750 and now the S500. But it's now 2022 and competition in the cycling GPS space is very, very strong. Brighton need to change their game plan when it comes to releasing new products. I sat here three years ago with a big shopping list of things that need to be fixed on the 450. I'm sitting here today with a big shopping list of things that need to be fixed on the S500. It's just not good enough. Look at the price point they're asking, it's an absolute no-go. Run the other way. At half the price of this, I would almost be comfortable with saying, maybe take a punt on it because the basics work, GPS and battery life, and fingers crossed they can fix the rest in firmware, but the ball is entirely with Brighton on this one. And with that, let's see what they do with it. Thanks for watching.